Best Podcast Ever is sponsored by the Gertzberg Law Firm, a full-service business law firm in Cleveland and Chagrin Falls that's changing the way businesses retain their attorneys. Go to GertzbergLaw.com to learn more. While you're there, check out Cover My Six, a complete legal audit of the six areas that most often create or prevent business lawsuits and government investigations. Go to CoverMySix.com to learn how we keep you safe. Enjoy the show. Ladies and gentlemen, you're about to listen to the best podcast ever recorded. Some of the best advice I've ever had in my life is from my father saying, you didn't start the fire. And it's amazing how much that plays into everything. Molly Gebler in the house. I am what in the house, doing? Alex Gertzberg. How are you doing, dude? I'm great. You look great. I feel great. You look fantastic. Ugh. You look like a million dollars. Ugh. Bring it. Keep Ma- going. Are Keep you? Going. Are you? Is Keep it? Are you, is it a new moisturizer? Is it a new? <sighs> well, you're you're positively glowing. Glowing, Molly. glowing, and not for the reasons that. No. Glowing is is no no. I just you know. I'm just I'm a ha- just having a happy day. Sure, why not? Every day is a happy day. It is a happy day. If my feet go from the bed to the floor, mm. it's a happy day. If you are above ground and vertical. Absolutely. Well, I mean, until I'm below below ground, and then right. I'm probably better off than I am right now. But, yeah. No, that's yeah. not true. Yeah, and heaven will be so much better Ew, than I this. see what you're saying. Yeah, I, yeah. See where you're, I see where you so want to So much better than this. Anywho, uh, what, did you have a good weekend? It's been a couple of weekends since we've been uh, at the uh, been. at the at the best podcast ever studios. It Molly. has been, yeah. Any highlights? Um, let's see. Oh. Right now, Carl Marish is going. Man, I can't wait to find out what, what Molly, Molly had, had for, for breakfast. breakfast. Yes. Um, this weekend I had a seminar on Friday in Strong. So, oh, we went to um. We made a night of it, and we stayed in Strongsville because I wasn't going to drive to be there at eight o'clock in the morning to Strongsville. Uh, so we we ended up we went out to dinner, uh, and we ate at Triv's in Strongsville. <gasps> oh, um, is that short for Trivisanos? It is. It is his restaurant, and I will tell you the best dinner there. I have ever really? had in a very long time. Wait, is that is that attached to a hotel? No, it's in a um like a st- strip okay. store anyway, thing. Best dinner ever. Yes, it was. The hotel was a little bit to be desired, but the <laughs> <laughs> that big what, Holiday Inn. Uh, what seminar did you have to go to? Oh, it was just a chamber, mm. making it relevant for 2020 type of okay. seminar. You know, to better myself. Is that possible? I tried. <laughs> I tried. Um, so yeah, Lovely. and then uh, you know what I had, I had a migrant on the way home, and Alex Kurtzberg, I am not a fearful person. I don't really, I'm not really afraid of right. much except air flying and reading. Um, <laughs> I was petrified. I thought I was going to die because you were driving. I was driving. Um, I had knew it was my fault because I knew my headache. I, you know, one of my for those of you out there that are listening that that deal with migraines, migraine you suffers. know it's coming. So it's it's just a faint little. You know it's coming. I knew it was coming. I knew I should have taken ibuprofen right away. Um, I only have medication that once it starts, like when I take it, I can't be driving or mm. my medication makes me very kind of drowsy and stuff. So. So I, I, w- I didn't even have that, to be honest. So I got in the car, and I'm driving, and it, it just really starting to hurt. Like, my head is. And it's always my migraines are in one spot all the time. And then all of a sudden, I started getting dizzy and, like, having these lightheaded moment. And then my eyes, literally, I, I'm sure they weren't, but I thought, like, in a cartoon, how eyes just Googly go eyes. like this. Yeah. That is... I. To the point where I took my sunglasses off because I thought maybe my eyes are trying to adjust to maybe a scratch in my sun. I, 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 and you're I don't driving. Know. And I'm driving oh, during. I was getting close to um, rush hour, so I ended up calling my daughter. I said, "I need you to stay on the phone with me 
because either I'm going <clears> to <throat> I'm going to crash or pass out and crash and and you need to know so I literally the whole time I'm telling her exactly where I am to know that in case I pass out right now I am I'm in front of Mally's right now or I'm in front of Solon I mean it was so I got home I took my medicine I went right to bed and slept for about an hour and I got up and I felt perfectly fine it is such a mystery to me that this is something that our modern science has not I know like just nipped in the bud I mean to the know? point where I I, don't, I would have loved a uh, MRI at that particular second right. because it almost was episodes so yeah. it would it, it would happen my eyes would go curly eyed and Ugh. then it would diminish a little bit I'd still have my migraine but this this dizzy thing and right. then I, I I joked with Sam I said I feel like I'm having a labor in my head because it was it, like every kind of sort well, of like, you know what the motto of the Gertzberg law firm is um, no, I emailed my doctor. So we solve problems. Yes. Molly, can I, can I help you solve this problem right yes, now? Yes, sure. I'm sure that your doctor, probably someone you've been seeing forever, is a great dude and very knowledgeable. But it strikes me that he probably cannot solve this problem for you, right? Yes. Because you, I'm guessing you've talked to him about it a million times and he's whatever. He well, no, because remember, if, if our listeners recall, I was to go to the doctor, which I have. Like a specialist. Because remember, I was, no, no, remember, I was going to go get my blood work because I was getting bruises yeah, on oh, my yeah, arms right, and right, such. Yeah. Um, so I did that, FYI. Oh, what did, what did that come out? And What happened there? Well, um, You're, you had nasty bruises. On I you. you look like somebody was like, I think I'm OK. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to get into okay. some things right now, but um, like I'm I am focused on this migraine head thing because I feel like there's something going on in my head. But then he was kind of I don't know. Well, but Molly, here's my this is what I was going to say. Um, I'm fairly certain that there are specialists who know more about migraines than any other doctor yeah. on the planet it's probably a neurologist me oh, pr probably but know. like i mean even if it meant like maybe they're in new york or in boston or something like i would this is a bad enough problem see you know what your problem that is was a can i tell you something molly can i tell you something about you, you that you probably don't know you you think that you can power through shit yeah. You, you think that y you've lived with it long enough. You're fine. Right. It'll, it's a temporary inconvenience. But I'm telling you, like, I think that there's. But he knows lately I have said to him to have migraines two times a week. It, it's becoming uh, abilitating. But for what, me so what's his what's me. his di what's his prognosis? So he put me on a steroid for a week mm -hmm. to see if 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 that could calm whatever is going on in my head. Did I it? did not have a migraine for a week. Yeah, but you the can't be on day, steroids. Well, brother. that's what I said to him. Yeah. Use that information with what you right. need it for, but I'm not going to be taking steroids. And then, of course, the next day I'm right. off of it, right. I get this. Right. So what's this, wh how is he using that information? Well, well, then he said there were some test results that he wanted me to come in and talk about. Mm. Um not wouldn't have anything to do with my migraines though mm -hmm. and after and, and i said to him okay i will but i tried to make an appointment and you're three months out and i need right. to explain what just happened with this migraine because yeah. um, i can't have that happening can, so maybe i'll look into what doctors would take care of migraines because i'm i've I never think, looked at that well, well so, be right so here. i can yeah i presume that the cleveland clinic or university hospitals have Probably in the migraine world, uh, which, you know, is probably like a sub niche of neuroscience. Right. He right? did want to do he does want to do a some kind of head scan. Yeah. But I just had a head Listen, scan a, a year ago. I, I'm willing to bet that our because our two hospital um, I'll find some. They're like the best in the world. I'll I bet you that, that within them is like maybe one, one of the top five to ten. Right. experts in this field so your doctor is a, probably a great dude but i'd great say guy. he ain't gonna solve this problem for you no that's I what gotcha. i'm saying and the meds that he wants me to take yeah. i can only take when i'm ready to go lay down yeah um all okay. right I, I've, said, I, I've said enough you know what our people are sick and tired of hearing my medical woes okay let's um, just move on you want to hear what i did last uh two weeks and then uh we'll introduce our guest sure uh 
Tiffany and I took an impromptu trip to New Orleans. It was amazing. If you haven't been to New Orleans and you like music, you need to go there. Molly, you're never going to go there unless <laughs> you start flying. Yeah. It was awesome. Um, and then I gave a speech in Chicago to uh, car dealers um, about how to, and Nick Weiss did too from here, um, gave a talk to them about how to secure their collateral, which I know you're you're always like, how do I secure my collateral, always, Alex? Always. Well, I should have listened How to do it. I get collateral? Well, there's that. Usually. That's a whole different speech. <laughs> um, and then um, this weekend, uh, can I give a shout out to um, like the greatest car dealership on the planet? Sure. But I have my own opinion. But. All right. Uh, we got Tiffany a new car this weekend, uh, and uh, we had this an incredibly amazing experience, uh, which I which it which seems like a weird way to describe a car buying experience, but uh, it was a Volkswagen of Streetsboro, mm. which is now part of the North Coast Auto Mall uh, family of companies. Gotcha. Right. Um, I would say that there are probably two um, really amazing uh, organizations, like. Uh, automobile organizations here in Cleveland that I that I know personally well. There's Junction those, Auto. I, I don't know them well, but I'm going to... No, I'm, I'm talking about the Motor Cars family and the North Coast Auto family. And like, Junction Auto. Okay. Excellent. Uh, anyway, uh, the guys at, at Volkswagen of Streetsboro really took care of us, and it was like such an easy experience. Uh, and, and she got this great car, and she's happy. And then we went and celebrated at Thorn Creek. And you know who was at Thorn Creek? No, oh, I don't. Uh, you weren't here for that interview, but it was John DeJulius. Oh, okay. Yeah. We were just talking about him recently. We were with Catherine Bosley. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so we saw John uh, there. And uh, um, anyway, that was our weekend. That sounds amazing. Yeah. I mean, I think I'm leaving stuff out, but that was generally it. On Friday, oh, on Friday, we went and heard this Grateful Dead cover band. Um, at uh, Music Box Supper Club. Okay. That was really cool. Have you been there recently? I have not. It's a, it's no, a neat little it's a uh, venue. Little, okay. Yeah. There is this. It's interesting. Um, folks listening, if you like the Grateful Dead, I don't know if you're aware of this, but this uh, these these cats, they put together a networking group of deadheads, right? Hmm. Of people who like the dead, right? And it's called Networking is Dead. That's their okay. group. So you go there, and it's a, it's like a bunch of professionals, you know? And, and every time they have one of these events, it's a networking event, but the money all goes to a charity. In this case, the charity was Achievement Centers for Children, which was cool. And it was a costume party. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and it was just, we you had... You dress up like dead people? Uh, well, so, some did. Uh, right. More like the Grateful Dead people, right? That, right. That's which, so that's said. more. Yeah. I, you, that might be a little more hippie than yes. dead, right? Would... But it was such a great time, um, and it's a, it, it's a cool. So if you're a deadhead and you're a professional um, and you hate networking, go to go check out Networking is Dead. It's a really cool experience. That's very clever. Anywho, <laughs> let's talk about my man Dan Fritz. Yes. Molly, uh, yes. assistant fire chief at the Orange Village Fire Department, Moreland Hills Council president and future mayor yes. of yes. Moreland Hills. Now, you and Dan know each other. We do. Right? We do. How do you yes. guys know each other? You know what? We're, it's very private, personal. Jeez. No, all right. No, it's <laughs> so, not. It's not at all. Down, so Molly. just everybody calm down. <laughs> um, no, I, I uh, engaged with Dan um, from the first responders week and mm. just got to know him that way um, with the, the chamber and uh, what we do for first responders week. Great, great guy. Yeah. Great guy. Yeah. Uh, let's bring him in. I can't let's wait to talk it. to him. Let's do it. Dan Fritz. Dan Fritz is in the house. Assistant Fire Chief, Orange Village Fire Department, Moreland Hills Council President, and future mayor. Which title is your favorite? Oh, boy, that's a tough one. I, I You know, I've been a firefighter for so long, and I've got a lot of pride associated with that career. Uh, but this mayor thing is going to be really exciting for me. So I, I, I got to say that that one's up and coming. And, and Unopposed. Be one of my top. Yes, that's right. Nice. Because who would oppose him? Right. Who, who would be... Who would be Stupid enough. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, what inspired you to run in for mayor? In the political arena? Yeah. You're asking this now, right. oxymoron? That's a, that's a good point. So, so yeah. what inspired me? Yeah. I I have to be honest with you and say Mayor Renda. Um, mm. 
you know, I've worked with uh, Mayor Renda for quite some time. In 2004, that was my first term on council. And uh, I enjoyed working with, with Mayor Renda at that point. Then she became council president. Uh, and soon after that, mayor. And she's just really led the way and showed uh, what good governance is and um, how was one she can termed? Really... She is not under term limits. No, okay. she has decided so not to run. she just decided. Okay. Correct. She just decided the time was right for her to step down. And... Um, Anyone who knows Mayor Renda in the Chagrin Valley will, will tell you that they're very inspired by her. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's very well respected. I don't know if you are both aware of this, but uh, I listen to your podcast and Jim Finley is one of the, mm-hmm. of the guests. So th- this kind of relates back to Jim Finley and, and Chagrin Fire. They recently entered our council chambers and awarded Mayor Renda the uh, prestigious uh, chief um, badge in Aww. honor of all of her efforts with Chagrin Fire and helping with the dispatch center. Uh, and it was kind of a, a very emotional moment for her because she takes a lot of pride with safety services, and, and I do as well. And uh, neat factoid, the only other person in recent history that's received that distinguished award from Chagrin Fire, I believe, is Tim Conway. Oh, really? So it's really? been kind of a big gap wow. there. Yeah, so it was I'd a big deal. So. Yeah. The, the actor, right? Yeah. The comedian actor? Yeah. yeah. Is yeah, that's that him. right? Yeah. yeah. Wow. I, I, I did just get, um, I, I don't know really what the official term is, but I was I became an honorary Chagrin Falls Fire person. Yeah, but you didn't get the chief. I did not get the <laughs> chief, but I was, I was told I was high ranked. Okay. And I got my own hat with my own embroidered name in the back of it. They might have made you like a captain or something. Maybe a captain. Yeah. Did this have anything to do with the um, the half naked fire that I calendar? hold all the pictures? Um, well, that's that a good point. Just, that might have played into yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, they just want to just make her happy because she holds yeah. all the pictures of us. Yes, probably. Um, probably. <laughs> what what d- does uh, um, are you is Orange Fire Department going to do a calendar? Um, you know, it's funny because I've heard some rumors, um, but I, I, I'm, I haven't heard it about Orange Fire. Okay. Wow. Well, we'll have to work on that. Do you? Yes. Do you want to? Yeah. Do you want to do uh, you know a what? calendar? By, by next I, I don't know, year, Alex. I'm not sure I'm worthy. <laughs> by I'd, by I'd, next I'd to, year, I'll be like a work for that one. such a professional. I mean, I have literally. Like I literally just finished the design of it, and the printer picked it up today. So I'll be so perfect by the time next year comes. Um, well, is going to be all then? excited to see it? I I, I work well, with Steve Voschek in Bedford Heights, and and we've all been ribbing him pretty good because we know he's in the famous group photo at the bottom yes. of the waterfalls. Yeah. Will you rip him? So so that that is a fear that I you know everybody's freak. First of all, the fire. Well, you never have to worry about that in the fire service. If, okay. if there's any any way to get yeah. in on somebody, they're, they're going to figure it out. They're freaking out, yeah. and they're freaking <laughs> out because they're not seeing. No one got to choose their own. I did not open up that can of worms. First of all, they're they all look fantastic. I mean, to the point where we made it an eighteen month calendar, not a twelve month calendar. Uh, what's the controversy? I, I mean, uh, who, who's ripping? The fire what, department is upset? nervous about these pictures coming out because they'll be made fun of because they all work in other areas other than Chagrin Falls. Well, and they should have all... thought about that before. They... Well, that, that's a good point. Yeah, and, and we are making fun of Steve, but yeah. but I'm told he looks fine. He looks phenomenal, gonna, gonna Steve. Yeah. You look okay. great. Don't panic. Don't worry. They'll all be jealous. But Alex, we're, we're, we're talking about the fire service and, and you asked what was the reason, you know, I wanted to be mayor. And yes, uh, Mayor Renda is is a big reason. You know, I've, I've seen how civility and respectful governance plays into the whole gamut of Chagrin Valley politics. But also a big motivator for me is safety services. It's been my life. It was my dad's life. Uh, there's nothing better than being a firefighter. And, you know, one of the most important things any community can do is to provide a certain level of safety for its residents. And I'm fortunate to live in a community where we do that in a top-notch manner, and I want to make sure that continues. So those two things really motivated me to, to um, step up. You've been a, uh, I have this in my notes, but to remind me, you've been a firefighter f- for how long? So Bedford Heights have been a firefighter for about 22 years now, and Orange a couple more years than that, so about 24. And, and you come from a long uh, history with your dad. I do. My, my dad was uh, a member of the Orange Fire Department for 34 years, and he was chief for 25. So I'm one of the rare firefighters in the area who had the absolute pleasure and honor of serving uh, on an active fire department underneath their father, who was the chief. So I went on calls with him and, How cool is and that? really got to share in some of the, uh, the really good times and, 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 of course, what comes with, with the field, some of the, the sad times. And uh, 
I got to see how he dealt with it. And some of the best advice I've ever had in my life is from my father saying, you didn't start the fire. And it's amazing how much that plays into everything. I'm sure you could say it in the legal field. I'm sure you could say um, everything with all the work you do. For oh, no, I start everything. You, you, pro- you do start some yeah, fires. I, I do know Everybody, that. yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, I'm a shit stirrer. <laughs> so so when, you, when you're not in charge of starting the fire and you're in charge of putting it out, you can come from a different perspective, one that isn't panicked and is more focused on the task at hand. And again, that with parenting, you know, some of the times you didn't start the fire with the kids, they started it, mm-hmm. so you take a step back. And so I find that advice he gave me, I find it amazing how many aspects in life that that is fit into and how often I think of that. Oh, what about your mother? Like uh, letting her husband go on a call. Now she's got her husband and her son going on the same call. That had to be pretty, um, it, as a mother, that had to be pretty hard for her. Um, have you ever met my mother? I have not. <laughs> I have not. You've had, but I've met your sister. So you've had a taste of my mother because you've met my sister. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Now I know. Yeah. Tracy will love that I said that. But, uh, <laughs> um, she, my mom was very supportive of my okay. father's efforts. And, uh, you know, when we were little, it was all volunteer and you'd be having a family get together, whether it was Christmas Eve or uh, just a family get together on a Sunday afternoon and he would get called away and um, he'd have to jump in his pickup truck speed away to the station, hop on a truck, and then drive to the call. And, you know, as a kid, he was he was my idol. I mean, I, I, I looked at him and thought that was so cool. And my mom supported him pretty well through that, too. I have to tell you, uh. to me, the most interesting thing about firefighters isn't the her- the heroism aspect of it, but although that's very interesting, right? The, I mean, the, the idea of going into danger to save people's lives, fascinating. But to me, the most interesting thing about it is – how most of the time you're not fighting fires. Most of the time you're preparing and cleaning and training. And 99% of your time, you're not doing the glamorous stuff, but you've got to do all of that other stuff perfectly in order to make that, that occasional, you know, catastrophic event go smoothly. And, and I don't, I'm not sure people really appreciate I mean, in the army, it was it was the same for me. It was the same thing. It was a lot of waiting and training and cleaning and you know, P, we called it PMC. Do you guys call it PMCS? We don't. Preventative maintenance, yeah. support, and services, okay. or something like that, um, or something like that. But but there's just um, I think there's a word for it. It's like ennui. It's just like it's all it's like almost boredom, but to an extreme. Not that you guys think of it that way but i did. <laughs> but yeah, no the, you're nailing it but you're the point it. is yeah i mean it's like you you really have to appreciate how um firefighters t- have to take all of that non-firefighting stuff so seriously in order to be good firefighters you know i think one of my friends said it best when i uh, got on early in, in the fire service he said you're not necessarily paid for what you do we're paid for what we have to do at the drop of a hat. Right. So it's kind of saying the same thing you are, right? That we yeah. have to we have to train, we have to know the ins and outs. You have to know your your drug protocols and yeah. in, in your you know operating as a paramedic. You have to know your standard operating guidelines. Acting as a firefighter, you have to know at least a basic rudimentary level of all hazmat. There's so many things we have to, yeah. you know, become familiar well, with that it that it can be it can be overwhelming. Well, and on t- and then on top of that, like Molly, like do you ever notice how clean? everything in a firehouse oh, is yes. and how clean the fire trucks are oh, and yes. i think there i think i d- to correct me if i'm wrong on this dan but i think there's two reasons for that one is because it works better that way but the other is because it reinforces the discipline that you have to have in order to you know work as a team and 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 support each other and be a good fire person like you have yeah, to I be meticulous you know and it, i think a third would be pride yeah you know there's a lot of pride in the fire service for all the joking around and complaining we'll do about you know, certain things associated with our field. One of them is not pride. You know, we all right. certainly share in, in the pride and, you know, having clean rigs and a shiny fire truck is, yeah. is part of the pride. Yeah. So. I, I commend you. And, and this is for you a full-time job, right? There's, you've got volunteers who had to do a part-time, but you're, you've always been a full-timer, right? So I started out at Orange and we were part-time with volunteers. Okay. So we had very minimal coverage in the station. We had one, maybe two people in the station at a time. And whenever an alarm came in, we would all have pagers and we'd all come to the station and, and help out on the call. 
Um, and we've gone from that to now having 45 uh, part-time firefighters in two stations and and running a lot more calls than when I started and when my dad was associated Orange with Orange has two stations? It does. So we have a, a newer station up at Pinecrest. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That's right. And how many calls on average a month does Orange see? So, uh, you know, we always talk about a year. So, okay. you know, uh, you can look at fire departments in the area. Orange, when I started, was doing around 300 and some calls a year, which was a slow department. And now we're up to about 1,000. And to give you an idea, in Bedford Heights, we do about 2,500 to 2,800 a, a year. When you say calls, is that result in a fire or is that someone having a heart attack That's too? That's everything, everything combined. Everything, okay. EMS and okay. fire. Yeah. Certainly the, the large majority of calls for any fire department around, uh, certainly this area, is going to be uh, paramedic EMS right. calls. Is every firefighter a paramedic? So typically, yes, but there are exceptions. But typically, and generally speaking, most career fire departments in the greater Cleveland area are staffed by firefighter paramedics. Okay. Wait, so so um, when someone dials 911 and it's not fire-related at all, the paramedic comes from the fire department? Correct. Wow. So are you seeing how much, uh, like, how much like fentanyl and heroin stuff are you seeing these days? So, so mm -hmm. that's a big... Um, that, that's sort of like a big issue for me. I, I've, I've become active with the, the school districts and coming in and lecturing um, from my perspective to students about the, making poor decisions with, with the opioids. Um, I think everyone would be surprised to know that, that this epidemic is in every community. I don't care if you live in Moreland Hills, you live in Sugar and Falls, you live in Bedford Heights, you live in Maple Heights, Lakewood, wherever. Mm -hmm. um, we're seeing it. And it used to be that uh, when we first started seeing, I remember the first heroin call I went on was an individual laying in the middle of the road on a commercial street that wasn't heavily traveled in, in, in the city where I worked. And he was unresponsive. We gave him some Narcan and he popped right out of it. And that sort of became the norm that, you know, this Narcan we were giving took you out of it and it reversed the effects of the opioids. Now what we're saying, Alex, to your, seeing Alex, uh, to your point with the fentanyl is everyone's mixing fentanyl and carfentanyl and with these, uh, with the heroin, to, so it has a bigger kick, and you get more people to come by and, and buy it, and you spread your, your supply. And the, uh, the antidote that we carry, the Narcan or Naloxone, um, isn't working. So, you know, our message to all the kids when I go out and talk in the schools is, you know this fail-safe thing that everyone talks about, Narcan, and, and you're the group of kids, and they say, hey, we have some Narcan. It'll bring you right out of it if we give you too much, and we're not going to give you too much so you're okay. That's not true. Um, I've been on plenty of calls where we've the cops have given Narcan before we got there. We've given them all we have on the on the squad, and they're still not out of it when we get to the emergency room. And we're losing some of these people. It's sad. Mm. Um, mm. Uh, yeah, it terrifies me. I, like I, it, it's it, it see, and I try not to be an alarmist about stuff, but like, um, or or a cynic. But it seems like today it's fentanyl, and then it was so, it was just opiates in general before, and then and it was heroin in general. And before that, it was meth. And it's one time that that, that you can screw get up your you whole hooked. life. Yeah. Oh, they, they yeah. Addicted. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. one time. Yeah. Oh, and then and isn't it a fact too, Dan, that like this? I don't know if it's fentanyl or or, or something related, but like it, it's a risk to you guys, right? Isn't it? It is, and and when that came out, I think um, I think it was kind of blown up a little. Like it bit. goes through your skin. Yeah, you know, if it, especially if you're in a place that is fabricating it, like mixing it, yeah, and, yeah. and it's a like. Let's say it's a house, you know, a clandestine house that is is making, you know, mixing heroin with fentanyl. And there's a drug raid and you go in there and some of the fentanyl has been spilled and it's airborne. Yeah, you know, absorption is, is, a, is a key route for drugs entering your body and it can be a hazard for us. I was at a poker game um, and mm. there was a, a police officer with there. With meth? No. <laughs> oh. I was just playing cards. You're wondering about that transition. Yeah, no, but, but yeah. there, was, there was a police officer there who told me about a bus that he participated in and... Um, he got, and he said he thought he was going into a coma um, because oh. he, he 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 didn't even think he was handling the drug. It was just in the air. So inhalation. Yeah. At that point. Right? Yeah. And he said he just started losing consciousness. It, it just got really lightheaded. Had a hard time breathing. Mm. He he said he thought he was at a place where uh, he could hear everyone okay, but nobody. But he was totally unresponsive. So that's pretty scary. Yeah. Let's bring this back to yes, a happy, please, well, I, maybe a happy question for you, maybe not. Can you think back on your storied career, uh, Dan, and think about, um, like, what stands out as so, sort of, like, the, the more memorable uh, um, things that you've experienced or observed in your career as a firefighter? 
So you know, that's always the million dollar question. You know, um, for me, the ones that really stick out in your mind, unfortunately, are the ones that are kind of bad. Mm. And, and, you know, as firefighters, at least where I work, we'll talk about uh, that's one to put on the shelf. And so we have this credenza behind us following us around for our career with various calls, you know, on the shelves. And um, most people might think it's, it's, it's all gore or it's a really horrific car crash or something like that. And, and it's just amazing how some of the calls where you show up and it's a couple who's been married forever and they're still relatively healthy and, and the gentleman died in his sleep and you're mm-hmm. there dealing with the wife in the worst moment of her hour, um, worst hour of her life. Or, um, you know, you're on the highway and a little kid's pulling on your pant leg begging you to tell you his mother's going to be okay when you know mm-hmm. your buddies are doing CPR on her and she's not going to be okay. Mm-hmm. And so, the, you know, those are, the, those are the ones you remember the most that, uh, that sure. at least for me, that it, it's not a visual sight thing, you know, that, that I remember. It's the emotions around, centered around the call right. that you just can't hang that stuff up. I mean, you'll, you'll think about those people that you've seen in their worst moment forever. And, do, you, do you personally have a hard time with it? Well, there, there's a big uh, movement today to help firefighters who struggle with this type of thing. And, you know, I think I'm doing okay, and I think most of my friends are doing okay, but we look out for each other. Um, for example, in Orange, if, if we have a particularly bad call, I do what my father uh, did a long time ago. Sometimes I'll call the girlfriend or the spouse and say, hey, you know, I'll use the name John Smith. So mm-hmm. we're not talking about anyone was on a real rough call. Just keep an eye on them. And, and if you mm-hmm. notice anything, we're here. We have resources, you know, a plethora of resources we can provide. And my dad used to do that. And I never knew he did that until he retired. And he told me. And a couple of my buddies said, yeah, I remember your dad calling, you know, hearing that your dad called my wife. And, That's and so we look cool. out for each other and there's a big movement uh, of awareness now. And um, I think it's really healthy for the fire service because, you know, you don't have to work in the Bronx to, to have this stuff accumulate and build mm-hmm. up. Um, you can work, you know, Chagrin Falls firefighters see their share of tragedy. We all know, mm-hmm. you know, think back five, 10 years and you can think of a handful of things that immediately pop into mind that are that are pretty bad. Mm-hmm. Um and so the good thing, though, Alex, is we're all looking out for each other. There's an awareness for it. And I'm sure in the military, you know, there was a similar effort to, to try and, yeah. you know, get that stuff reeled in, too. Well, I don't I don't know that um, people spent a lot of time thinking about um, how much trauma you guys see, you know, especially on the paramedic side. Right. So, like, y- you go in, um, you put a put a fire out. Everyone hopefully survives that presumably. Um, when when tragedy strikes there, right? I'm guessing it's more rare than what you it see is. on a day to day basis with people ODing or, you know, guns, knives, whatever, right? That's that's probably more. That's, that's very accurate. You know, yeah. the days of of you know now we're talking about working in the Bronx, right? If we're going to talk about active firefighting, you know, there there's most of your municipalities and smaller cities throughout the country now they're they're providing EMS and that's their their right. main main job. And sprinkling some fires and some car accidents. Yeah. And uh, there was something big today. Was there? Yeah. Where? I mean, just based, I don't know what it was. Say somewhere just in the world. Rumors. Somewhere, See, shit somewhere, somewhere, in the world. somewhere in the world, something no, big happened. No, just um, lots of um, fire people. Lots of Around sirens. Here? Lots of sirens oh. today. Well, I remember um, when I was in Iraq, um, I um, was near a, a, a death was around me once on one day. And it was a, um, a, a a soldier, a U.S. soldier, who was um, being recovered. He had been shot in the stomach, and he was, and I could see his feet sticking out of this Humvee, right? And he was being brought back, and that was as close to death or dead bodies as I came. That and and all I saw were, were his feet, and and, the, and just the knowledge that I had that there was a guy with his gut shot out inside of it. I don't know what happened to him. I, I think he might have died. That was totally traumatizing. Yeah, you'll remember those feet until the day. Forever, forever, right? Forever. And I remember that day and, like, for a couple days afterwards, like, I was was walking around, like, almost shell-shocked, like, stunned. And that is a tiny, 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 itty-bitty fraction of the kinds of trauma that you guys see and that over the course of your career, or infantry soldiers, or, you know what I mean? And and the point of that is that... um, I think that you at some point have to develop a different kind of wiring in your brain, in your mind, to deal with that kind of trauma on a regular basis and not be as affected by it as I was from that one tiny little glimpse of death. Mm-hmm. 
You know, I mean, do you ever think about that? Yeah. The, when, I, when I first started there, there was um, critical incident stress debriefing or CISD was something looked upon as you were weak if you, you if you brought in CISD. Um, you know, those were resources available to us. And you're referring to that wiring. That, that's actually something you need to do. You need to right. talk about it. You need to. You know, there's something called gallows humor, which is crazy mm. as it sounds. You need to come back to the station and de-escalate with, with some some kind of humorous right. aspect to something that just happened. Um, and now CISD is routinely brought in. So if a department faces a particularly particularly horrific call, the chief will make a determination. It's not up to the field. Just bring or she'll right. just bring them in yeah. and, and you'll be required to come in and go through Plus it. Plus in these small town um stations you know i know when i found my mom passed away in in bed um uh, you know to have the local people that i'm hanging with uh, mm. you know taking naked pictures with uh the fire department you know what i mean like and they've got to come in so i would think that you've got to you have a lot of that because you guys are embedded into the communities that you work. I mean, that's hard to, I always joke with John and say that if, if I'm having a heart attack before he calls 911, he has to make sure my legs are shaved and that <laughs> take drag me or get the razor. And then he can call the fire department because it's going to be Jim Finley and Frank Zug. And I, actually, I don't want him to see unshaved legs. I actually legs. think this is a real conversation that Molly <laughs> it has is had with John. Absolutely. <laughs> Many well, times. Like, well, it's clean the house, you know, clean the house a little bit, get the razor. <laughs> Oh, like the house is burning down. down. <laughs> I, I do have something of a humorous memory. So we were talking about like, you know, these points in your career that you think back that had an impact. One of those is kind of a funny story. And is it okay if I share that real briefly? Please. The, the, so we like humor. I was a newer firefighter and I was working at the time at Oakwood Village and I uh, worked there for maybe a year and a half. But uh, I was, I, every time I'd go on a call, I'd call my dad, you know, a first fire or I'd call him on a stepped up squad call and tell him what we did. So here we are. Um, we get a call for a cat stuck in a tree. And I was so excited because I said, I, I can't wait to tell my wife and my friends I got to rescue a cat out Classic of a tree. It's, call. it's like, you know, Norman Rockwellian, <laughs> you know, in terms of what you can do in the fire service. Right. So. So we showed up, and I mean, this was a classic cat in the tree call that couldn't have been scripted better by John Irving or pick your favorite author. There was a crying girl in the front yard with Dad standing there trying to help her out. And we get off the, the rig, and, and we go up to the little girl, and she takes us to the backyard and points up to this tree. And I'm looking up there. I'm like, that cat's kind of high. You know, <laughs> the cat's pretty pretty far up there. But uh, the guy who was in charge of the call, you know, you typically have like a 24 and a 35-foot ladder on the engine. He's like, go, go grab the 35-footer. So we went and we grabbed the 35-footer and we put that ladder up all the way on the tree. And we looked around and um, newest guy goes, right? So I'm all excited. I'm glad I get to go. So I climb up this ladder and I'm getting up there and it's starting to move a little bit each time I get towards the top. And I'm okay with heights, but this was starting to get a little scary, right? <laughs> So I get up there and I look and he's about five feet off on the branch. And Molly, you know, I'm a cat lover. You know, yeah. people joke around all the time about my cat pictures on Instagram. You and By the way, Alex, Instagram cat pictures, check them out. You, you and Chris D'Amato. <laughs> yeah. Done. So, so he's, he's out there like maybe five feet. So now I have to kind of lean out and, and do the grab behind the neck where I know it's not going to hurt the cat. So I grab this cat, lift him up and I pull up in my turnout coat and I'm going to put the cat in my turnout coat. We're going to be good. We're going to climb down. I got within a foot of my face, and this cat went crazy. Oh. And he started carving up my face oh. and scratching me. How, how my eye didn't get scratched, I don't know, because when, uh, when we looked in the mirror after the call, I had a scratch that started on my forehead, went over my eye, and then came down oh my cheek. Oh, my gosh. And I just, I'll always remember the individual, the, the, the officer, the lieutenant on the, the, the rig down there going, just drop it, drop it. So I dropped this cat and I saw him like falling in slow motion, moving his paws left Seventh and right. Seventh life, and, sixth exactly. life. And he hit the ground and he took off running and he was fine. And then oh. when I called my dad that night, he gave the old adage in the fire service. He said, Dan, you never see any cat skeletons in trees. <laughs> so, so now I've learned my lesson. We'll, we'll show oh. up and say, that cat will come down. You'll be okay. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. yeah. What a, I mean, that is just, it couldn't be any... Um, 
more iconic <laughs> than the cat. Well, I, I think that there is um, probably a metaphor for life there, Molly, and that is that sometimes you just got to drop the damn cat. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. like what I mean. Yeah. Sometimes and you just got to <laughs> drop it. What about a call? What's the silliest thing that you were asked to do? Um, oh boy, that would be like rescuing ducks out of a storm drain. I think almost every firefighter. Already Although has you had to did do that, that. We did. and videoed it, mm -hmm. and it got huge reviews. Yeah, so you, yeah. Know, you, can, you can get some, you know, notoriety, some publicity yeah, on that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, from the drains. Was that at Pinecrest? That was at the, so that was done at Pinecrest. Yes, I remember. The one I was on though was at a condo uh, okay. for miles. Okay. Um, but the funniest thing I think um, we were at a house fire. My dad was chief at the time, and he sent me in after a while, and I was paired up with a firefighter who has since retired. He's he's been retired for ten years now. And the rule in the fire service is you never get separated from somebody, and I'm sure there's military adages for that too. But so we went into this house, heavy smoke. Um, not, not super dangerous, not a lot of fire. We were trying to find it, but there was a lot of thick smoke. So we're on our SCBAs and we're crawling around and I got separated from this guy. So finally, um, I'm figuring running low on air. I'm like, I got to get out of the house. And I stood up and I threw a light haze. They'd started to ventilate the house, get some of the smoke out. I saw Dennis in the mirror and I saw Dennis over on the side of the room. So I started screaming, Dennis, let's go, let's go. And I'm screaming at him. He's not listening to me. And I'm screaming, screaming. And I realize, yeah, I'm looking at a mirror. And it was <laughs> me. It was me. I was <laughs> so as the mayor of Moreland Hills, you will be, um, it will be the Chagrin Falls Fire Department, yes? So Chagrin Falls uh, serves the village of Moreland Hills along with Bentleyville, Hunting Valley, right. South Russell, Chagrin Township. Mm -hmm. Um and uh, so, yeah, they will be our and still are. They do a wonderful job for us. We're proud to, to have them. Yeah. Serve us. And yeah. you're but are you still going to serve as the assistant fire chief in Orange? I am there. There's uh, you know, I also work shifts there. So that's going to dwindle quite a bit. I'm going to have to make some adjustments there. Yeah. Um, it's all about fitting, fitting the time frame. And, um, you know, I've sat down with the mayor and the fire chief and we were in agreement with me uh, kind of trimming back the, the shifts I work during the day there. So have that daytime available. Is it a full-time position as the mayor? No. The mayor is a part-time position, yeah. correct. Okay. And it's been, you know, you look at Mayor Renda, she certainly uh, treated it as a full-time job and right. had a very strong presence in the community. And I'd like to, you know, I want to keep that open. Mm -hmm. I think that's served the residents well. But, we, you know, we've had um, mayors in the past who were litigators who worked downtown and were gone, you know, Monday through Friday quite a bit. But I think you do see and feel the difference between a mayor who does work full time and a mayor who like I, I'm thinking Mayor Coons off the top of my head. You know, I mean, he's entrenched in it. You see him out in everything because he's retired and he has that sure. opportunity. But yet it is a part time job. I mean, you do f feel the the mayors who, although it's part time, have more of they a presence. give it there. Yeah. Bill Coons was a teacher of mine. At was Orange. he? Yeah, he's a great guy. Oh, I love him. Yeah, I he's, love he's him. He's a great guy. Um, and uh, what is your agenda? What's the what's the first hundred days as mayor? <laughs> first hundred days. <laughs> mayor Fritz. What's the first hundred days? Well, I guess you always have to be careful here. Um, yes. <laughs> Believe me, no, it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> it doesn't. You could say whatever you I, want. I can assure you, matter. however, that Molly and I will uh, will never be running for anything because of the things we've said on this show. So just keep that in mind. Because it's it's etched in stone. <laughs> yes. It's, 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 Yes. So so my message uh, to voters and in, in, since you mentioned, as you mentioned, I'm unopposed. Mm -hmm. There hasn't been a huge campaign. There's been a little bit of social media presence and a little bit of door knocking um, and some meet and greets for some of the council candidates where I've gotten to say, you know, a few words. But but for me, it really is a continuation and it's a continuation of civility uh, communication, you know, communicating with the residents. Mayor Renda has improved that with a newsletter. Um, that we, we had one before, but it did not to the magnitude we've had, and I hear nothing but accolades about that. We need. To, how do you sign up for that? The chamber should be on that newsletter, so we can. So we can hook you up. Yeah, we can get you signed up for absolutely. that. Absolutely. And then uh, you know, kind of just walking down the same path that uh, you know a, a lot of people think, and, I, and I'm sure you folks know, and, and all the people you've interviewed in, in your professional careers as well. You know, mayor isn't isn't a king or a queen. It's it's there's this is you know may sound cliche, but it's absolutely a team effort. You're not going to do anything without an engaged and supportive council mm -hmm. on the big issues where you really need council to support you. 
And you're not going to get anywhere without good administrative heads. Mm-hmm. Um, you're not going to get anywhere without a good service director, without a good law director. Um, those, it just won't happen. Mm-hmm. So you got to have all those cogs. And are they in place for you or mm-hmm. do, are they doing some elections? So, so uh, a lot of those positions I, I mentioned are full-time positions with the village. Um, and others are appointed by the mayor uh, at his or her pleasure. And, um, you know, after the election, it would be sort of inappropriate to start engaging in that right now while mm-hmm. Mayor Renda's still got uh, time right. in office. Um, but I'll have to kind of feel out, you know, everyone's desire. And um, my hope is that we can maintain, you know, pretty much everybody who's, right. who's there because she's put together a great team. But council, Rotor. that's a voted position, correct? Council is. In Moreland Hills, we have six council members. Are and you keeping every all two six? Years, every, well, um, I, this is my election cycle as council member. So three of us are up. So I'm not included in that because I'm going to be, I'm running right. for mayor. So there's three positions up with okay. two incumbents. And then the open position um, has a couple people interested in it too. So okay. that's assuming the incum- incumbents get elected. Right. Um, so some form or another out of four, we're going to have three council members okay. who will be new. Newly elected, I should say. Mm -hmm. Do you, um, have you flagged any specific issues, whether in zoning or just, uh, you know, preservation or whatever that the village has that you're going to sort of prioritize over others? Yeah. um, For me, the protection of our zoning is paramount. Our residents have been very explicit about that. Um, I've been passionate about protecting the zoning and again that's something that's tell us a little bit yeah, more protecting about from that. what what are the so, threats so, so good question um what is cherished so much in moreland hills is our two acre zoning one home per two acres mm. and it's actually the way it's written it's like 1.96 acres um but residents love that so they don't like to see any changes to that um the trick for for any administration and legislative body is when they're looking to protect their zoning to have a have a game plan throwing a blanket down over your your municipality and saying everything is one home on two acres sounds good and a lot of residents may want that but in the realm of of what is feasible and doable it's not a good goal and it's not a good practice to to attack your zoning with one size fits all so it's this n- intricate strategy that that we've sort of seen uh, by going to the Supreme Court. You know, Susan Renda, then council president, and I uh, went down to Columbus and we watched our attorneys argue the Jalen case in 2006 in front of the Ohio Supreme Court and giving reasons why we need to maintain our zoning. And we won. And what we find is when you have a practical and intelligent application and it lo- in looking at all of your land from 10,000 feet up and looking down at it and coming up with zoning that takes away a good and successful counter argument to what you want, that's your goal. You need to remove that counter argument. And how do you do that? There, there, there's some diversity required so that you're realistic. And sometimes that diversity is not very favorable with people who want everything the same and don't want any changes. Um, we took our largest parcels in Moreland Hills uh, in one of our last comprehensive land use uh, plan updates a number of those plans ago. And we said anything that's 10 acres or more, that zone for one home per two acres, but has topographical constraints, we see a problem there. A builder could buy that and say it's, it's a taking of the land because I can't put one home per two acres on that 20 acre plot or if God forbid Hiram House Camp ever leaves and they have no plans of doing so. But if they ever did, a developer could say that 120 acres there, I can't fit in 60 homes because of all the hills and the lakes. So this is kind of what I'm referring to. We we created a U4 zoning that looks at those tracts of land that are available, the last vestiges of big land that can be built upon in Moreland Hills. And we said, you can still have your density if you ever buy that land, and but you can cluster those homes closer together, but you can still only have one home per two acres. So if you see my point, we've kind of preemptively taken away that argument that could eventually be used by a builder saying, you know, that's a taking of the land. It's impractical zoning. It's, it's not in, in uniformity with the 20 acres over there that's flat that a builder can build the exact density on. So... It's very intricate. You make changes like that. By the way, that was supported by 82% of our voters, which you show me another wow. zoning yeah. change that's supported by 82% Anything of voters. Yeah, really, good point. Anything. Yeah. 
Um, we're going to hand out free money. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll give you a 78% pass so, rate. Yeah. So that, 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 I have a problem not, with that. Yeah, it's th too green. That's yeah. like your, yeah. your, your primary priority, it sounds like. It, it is to keep, keep looking at it yeah. and, and stay strong and stay educated. Um, seek out that sound legal advice that we've been getting. Um, Len Spermuley who's the current mayor over in Bentleyville. He was one of the, the, when I said we went down and watched our lawyers argue in front of the Supreme Court, Len was one of the masterminds behind the defense of our two-acre zoning in front of the Iowa Supreme Court. So not many people may remember he wears that feather in his camp and his cap, and we're darn darn proud of it. And He's and glad still, he's staying, right? He's not. Uh, I believe someone, he is. Yeah, I no believe one's running against him. I believe or, he's running unopposed. Yeah, he's awesome. So, Alex, that's, that's what our residents want. It's very important to them. Um, and I take it very seriously and, and, and just, you know, it's a goal of mine. I, I always tell residents, I grew up in Orange Village and went to Orange schools, love the schools. I still have some of my best friends today are from Orange High School. We had a great time, um, a good, good education, and it was a great community to grow up in. Um, but I'll tell you, when I drive around some of the, the communities that collectively make up what we call the Sugar and Valley, and I know there's a big heated debate of what defines a Sugar and Valley, but mm -hmm. well, I'm going to say all the communities around this area. Yes. Um, most of them look, a, I wouldn't say drastic, but most of them had some, some very significant differences when you look at them when you're driving around today. Moreland Hills, where I spent a bunch of time hanging out with a bunch of different friends in different areas, still looks pretty darn much like Moreland Hills when I, when I was growing up. And we're very proud of that. And, and that doesn't come with luck. There's plenty of people out there who would like to make money on, on land in, in the Sugar and Valley. Um, it comes with hard work, um, taking pause and becoming educated and, and getting sound legal device and, and staying true to your cause with your game plan and, and most of all having that game plan. Well, and, and at the same time, it, um, you, that's interesting that you said that about the different communities in the Sugar and Valley. They, in some ways, they're 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 somewhat homogenous, but they're also so different from each other. Yeah. Talk about regionalism, um, uh, particularly in the, in the in the fire service, right? So so, um, it's so there's partnerships among the different communities, right? Um, for at least fire departments, right? Um, there's, um. Only one is it. I don't know if Bedford is the is the court. There's like there's like a court in Bedford. There's like a court in Chardon. Not everyone has their own full court system. Correct. Right. Some people don't have police either. Auburn right. uses yeah, the, county yeah. the county, and Newberry uses yeah. the county. So so do you think that's going well, or it could be better? Or I absolutely think it can be better. But 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 here's the caveat: there there's a department in 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 Ohio that has been regionalized and been tackling the model of, of successful regionalism since 1934. And that department is the Sugar and Falls Fire Department. Um, regionalized since 1934 is what you could say. And, and what you have, if you look across Cuyahoga County, are all of these fire departments that could have a, a similar model. And there have been some efforts in, in my career to get that going. The county's taken the lead and, and come in and done some studies about regionalizing fire services within communities, but always in the way are politics and territorialism. Mm -hmm. And in the Chagrin Valley, I think we've, uh, when I say we, I say the Chagrin Falls Fire Department has done an outstanding job in, in making uh, three-year contracts for municipalities to be able to successfully plan uh, financially for their coverage for every three years. Um, and provide that at a reduced cost as opposed to everyone having their own fire department. And, and uh, you know, there's certain certainly pockets of, of fire departments in the area that, that could, could learn from that. And, and let me give you an example. If you drive, let's say, the Hillcrest area, and I'm not saying that the Hillcrest area hasn't tried. They, I'm sure there's all kinds of conversations going on with shared services that, that I'm not privy to because I don't work over there. But, but just to talk about the Hillcrest area, if, if you drive down Mayfield Road and so you're looking at what? You're looking at Cleveland Heights, South Euclid, Mayfield, Mayfield Heights, Lynnhurst. Lynnhurst. You know, every one of those fire departments, let's say, has a ladder truck. And this is, this is the example I always bring up. You take that square mileage. For, ladder trucks are expensive. They're about a million bucks. So you look at that square mileage and you pick it up and you go over to Cleveland and you set it down on Cleveland in a more population-dense area that same square mileage, do you think they have the same amount of ladder trucks? No, mm -hmm. they might have a couple. Um, they have more staffing, so you know we need to be realistic when we're comparing apples to apples. 
But just from the very basic level, when we talk about regionalism, that the ladder truck is symbolic of, of, of one of the reasons why we can do better. Um, and, and there are talks that I've heard about in that Hillcrest area, to be fair, with sharing ladder trucks and, and hopefully making some smarter purchases in the future that, that uh, everyone in here in the greater Cleveland area needs to do, whether you're southeast, whether you're Hillcrest, whether you know, you're Bainbridge, over Lake County. Are they their own or are they with anybody? Bainbridge is their own. Their own. Mm-hmm. So help me understand that on a more basic level, right? So Orange has its own fire department chagrin falls village has its own fire department bainbridge has its own fire department the regionalism that you're talking about means that in addition to having their own resources they also share resources to sort of have more uh, support uh, for like for big fires or right uh, that that's right? where the success is alex and then there is success there for example in orange village if we catch a working fire month ago we had one in the orangewood neighborhood automatically dispatched at the same time we're getting chagrin falls we're getting Mm -hmm. solon um you know we're getting pepper pike and we're getting warrensville heights for a squad all of us are being dispatched at the same time and we have absolutely made strides in that regard hillcrest area same thing they've regionalized their dispatch and they get everyone gets uh, toned out at the same time so we are seeing um steps in in the positive right direction what also has happened in the Chagrin Valley, though, is you have um, municipalities like Moreland Hills, like Hunting Valley, like Bentleyville, that don't have their own station, brick and mortar fire apparatus sitting in the Bay fire trucks. South but Russell. they're served. Yeah, thank you. In South Russell, they're serviced by Chagrin Falls Fire Department. So mm. there are a bunch of communities who are regionally served by one fire department. And, and it's that's why you know, I, I mean, the Chagrin, I, I think a lot of people don't know that fact that the Chagrin Falls Fire Department is services so many different communities. They should be the Shrin Valley Fire Department. Well, let's say you, you raise a good point because there, you know, uh, there are areas, you know, we talk about other communities in the Shrin Valley. If you look at Orange, that there's some areas that, that Orange might be closer to mm-hmm. uh, for a Moreland Hills resident. And the Chagrin Falls Fire Department has been very open to working with Orange and uh, Moreland Hills so that, uh, God forbid, we get a man or a woman down and not breathing up in that area. We now are dispatching orange at the same time um dan we're going to take a very short break and when we return we are going to um gently guide you through what we colloquially call the lightning round oh okay are you ready for the lightning round? i i think i am i Mm. i hope you are okay he's done Um, his homework folks we will be right back Hey folks, Alex Gertzberg here. I am CEO of the Gertzberg Law Firm and Cover My Six. I hope you're enjoying the show so far. I wanted to take a quick second to tell you about something special we're doing at Cover My Six. If you own or run a business, I want you to go to CoverMySix.com to see if you qualify for a no-cost business vulnerability assessment. My business lawyers will meet with you in person, go over your customer contract, your employee handbook, and your other key legal documents, and help you spot any legal minefields that they see. We'll also give you some guidance on how to stop those minefields from blowing up your business. So go to CoverMySix.com to see if you qualify and to sign up. Thanks, and enjoy the rest of the show. All right, we're back. This lightning round, it doesn't involve, like, I'm not, nothing's going to hurt, right? My, you're a hiker, and you're fit and in shape. You'll okay. be fine. No, no, it's no. going gonna to hurt. You'll be fine. <laughs> Dan. Great. Molly has some lightning round questions for you, Molly. Okay. I do. I do. Thank you, Alex. You're welcome. Um, Dan, what are you binging? Uh, so, I do like to binge watch certain Who shows. Who doesn't? And uh, recently, it's been uh, The Politician. You I like did that? do that. You guys I, like that. I liked it. Yeah, I haven't seen it. Is it good? I yeah, liked I, it. I think I think it's phenomenal. And, mm-hmm. and who, the individual, he's he's a he's a Broadway um, yes. musician. I'm trying to. Yes, if you say it, he was in uh, Evan Hansen. Yes. Yes. And he's phenomenal. Um, the show's great. It's funny. It's dark. Uh huh. Huh. Um, you know, then the uh, the standards too. Like I I did Breaking Bad. 
I had the flu a number of years ago, and I watched uh, The Wire in like a week while I was in bed. I felt like I was living in Baltimore. I don't know The Wire. Uh, Dan, yeah. have you watched The Righteous Gemstones? I haven't. Dude, do you have HBO? Uh, I, I have access to it at the firehouse. You, uh, If you liked Breaking Bad, you will love The Righteous Gemstones. It starts out hysterical. Well, it is hysterical all the way through, but then it gets really grave. Okay. Um, well, I, I strongly you recommend you it. It's me. so good. <laughs> so good. All right. Keep going. Can I watch it, Alex? Well, you don't have HBO. Nice. Okay. I'm just reminding you. <laughs> Maybe you should get HBO. Sounds like go to the fire. House, I yeah. broke up with cable. Yeah, no, I'm I know. done. I did too. I, we, had, we had a very yeah, very seventy too. bucks savings a month. I have my little Roku yeah, TV. Yeah, but just HBO like fifteen done. bucks. HBO is yes. like a movie ticket times twelve. All right, uh, Molly, <laughs> oh. what's your next lightning round question <laughs> for Thank you, Dan Alex. Fritz? Um, Dan Fritz, what's the perfect day? Your perfect day. My perfect day. Would say I'd say to have to start out with breakfast with my family. Nice. I love going out to breakfast. Where? Where are your places? So uh, we're in Chagrin. I Everybody can't has anyone a place. Here. My place is Casa Nueva down in Athens, Ohio. OU. Okay. It's just the, it's wow, the best you really place to just breakfast. didn't want to get. It's very I know. That's a very, very far specific, drive for breakfast. But it plays into the rest of the day. Okay. Because the rest of the day would then be. Whichever group of the family would like to go with me to go backpacking and spend the night under the stars because I love, as my friends will tell you, I love getting out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, my oldest son, Jared, and I backpack together. Uh, we're going to hopefully be going out um, to Joshua Tree Park mm. uh, in February and do some desert hiking, which we've never done. So so it would it would include backpacking and, and underneath the stars away from all the technology. Okay. That would be my perfect day. I love that. I love that. Um, what is on your mind? What is on my mind? You know me. You know what's <laughs> on my mind, politics. I, I yes. am a sucker for politics. I've always been fascinated with them, whether it was at uh, high school or taking some political science courses at OU um, and getting engaged locally uh, in Athens in some of the, the causes. I'm a big political junkie, so I'm always following. Um, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but like recently it's very interesting to follow politics. Do you think? <laughs> Molly won't let me talk politics on this show. No. no I, I, so won't, I, won't, I won't engage Every year is interesting. But, but, I mean, but politics are always on my mind. Uh, and other than that, I have to go with uh, the people uh, who surround me in my everyday life that I love and some who have, have gone too soon. I think about mm. them often. Because mm. your dad has passed. My dad has passed. Yeah. And we recently lost my father-in-law as well, mm. who is, mm. both of them were my idols. They were funny. They were, you'd walk into a room and they were instantly talking to people and getting to know them. And five weeks later, when you bumped into those friends, I met your father-in-law or your father. You, they, he is the best, funniest, nicest guy I've ever met. And yeah. they both left us too soon. So I think mm. about them often. Damn them. <laughs> um, uh, if you weren't a fireman, firefighter, mm -hmm. it's 2019. If you weren't, although I, I can call you a fireman, I think so because I'm just referring can't refer to you. To a group, correct? With the assumption that they're all men. Yes. Um, <laughs> we do have a lady in the calendar, so do you really? firefighters? Yes. We've got some darn good uh, firefighters who are, are female. A female, and, yeah. And, uh, uh, if you like weren't a firefighter, mm -hmm. what would you be? I would like to think if I wasn't a firefighter, one of my passions would have been to be a writer or mm -hmm. a musician. I love reading books. So Yeah, you writing, and me both. Yeah. yeah. I'm reading educated now. Have you read that? I don't read. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's why Alex was laughing. <laughs> I am I an author. I do it? write books. I was gonna I just say don't read. You've, you've written books. I can read don't. my own children's books. Okay. <laughs> well did <What> you <laughs> what is educated? Educated is a it's a memoir of a young girl who grew up in in uh, Utah near Ruby Ridge. Remember the Ruby Ooh, Ridge yeah. thing, the Weaver family, and it was about her uh, experiences growing up in a home that absolutely would not permit any intrusion at all from society or government. Mm. Um, and there were some very rigid rules and some wow. borderline, Ugh. you know. This Bad is a true story. Yeah, and, and how she mm. overcame it and went to uh, educate herself at Brigham Young. And that's where I'm at right now. I think she 
probably mm. goes on to do some more things. I don't, mm. I'll read about, but it's a couple friends recommended it, and it's a fabulous book that's so far. I like the writing style. Interesting. Interesting. Hey, Alex, what you got? Dan, you are stranded on a desert island, shipwrecked oh, for a minimum. Awesome. A minimum of three months. Okay. But possibly for the rest of your natural born life, you have no idea. Wow. Okay. You may bring with you any single author's entire bibliography. Who is the author? Well, I'm a huge Stephen King fan, but I don't think I would bring that repertoire. I think I'd go with John Irving. Ooh. I'd go with Cider House Rolls, Garp. Yeah. Fifth, I'm, just, I I'm saw speaking. The movie. I'm speaking a foreign language. I saw the here. movie Carp. Um, Interesting. I, yeah, um, Cider House Rules. I think maybe? that's the first time I, I've heard that name. The World According to Garp. You didn't see that movie. I did see that movie, but I'm saying from our guests, I think that's the first oh. time. Prayer John for Irving. Prayer for Owen Meany. That's a great book. Okay. He didn't do Walter Mitty, did he? I don't believe so. Okay. I've never read anything by John Irving. Yeah, I you thought, should pick him up. You like I, him. I, I I know I should. Um, and. I've seen the, what movies are out about his books. I couldn't quite latch on to. Yeah, it was like Hotel New yeah. Hampshire was one. Cider House Rules. Yeah. Um, Toby Maguire, I think, was in Cider House yes, Rules. Yes, he was. And Garp, as you mentioned. Yeah, that was a that was an interesting. It was Robin one. Williams, I think. Yes, was it was. Yeah, and who John Lithgow, I think, played yes. the, uh, the other character who was was very interesting. Yeah. Um, same shipwreck, same island, same unknown, indefinite period of time. Well, I guess it's definite, but you, it's indefinite as far as you know when you get there. Okay. Uh, you may bring with you any single musician's entire discography. Well, that's easy. That's Ooh. Bruce Springsteen. Oh, oh interesting. Sure. All right. For sure. It's okay. a popular one. I'd say. Uh, I don't Oh, no, we've heard it. Yeah, really? I'd say uh, maybe three or four. Really? Yeah, I mean, you'd have the hard rock aspect of yeah. Born to Run and Greetings from Asbury Park. Then you'd have the solemnity, if you will, of Nebraska and then some of the, you know, Western themed mm. albums. He's he's just so far. All, you know, everyone always thinks of Bruce Springsteen is just born in the USA mm-hmm. and yeah. rocking out, which he still does tremendously. But. He's got some diversity in his repertoire. Did, did you ever? Um, so I've I've never really been a big fan of Springsteen, okay. but um, did you ever listen to this? Uh, I don't know if it was like a bootleg release or, or it was the Pete Seeger sessions. Yes. Did you ever listen yes, to that? That's I have. fascinating. That's crazy. Yeah, you did got you, some stand up bass and some banjos in it. Yeah, and it's and, all and, folk and, music. Yeah. Hmm. Um, like uh, it's all did, like Froggy went a court and yeah. stuff, but, but yeah, really good. Something w- was going to tell me that the two of you would be jamming out to the same music. Are you a Deadhead? Are you a fish? Uh, I like the Grateful Dead. Oh, Are yeah. you a fish? I saw probably six or seven Dead shows with my wife from Excellent. there back in okay. the day. Okay, all right, including so, the Neville Brothers in Pittsburgh. That was one of my with top the shows. Grateful Dead. Yeah, that was oh. their wow. guest for so, the day. Um, I just feel like you guys. Uh, yeah, um, there was a dead. I'm bringing us back to the banter session we had earlier, yes. but uh, there was a dead cover band uh, that we went to on Friday night at Music Box Supper Club, okay. and it was part of this um, thing called Networking Is Dead. Okay. Have you heard of that? I have. Um, who's the name behind that? I thought it was somebody. Well, it was one dude named Ken, and then there was uh, another guy whose name I can't remember. It was a really fun night, though. Um, Anywho, go on, Alex. Do you uh, no, have there any was another, other but there was another. Uh, there was a, something else Dan said, but I can't remember. What is the habit or routine that you currently do on a regular basis that has given you the most mileage? It's easy to be a cynic nowadays. Um, trusting in humanity Ooh. is is one that uh, I. Knock on wood, it, it, they they let you know you can get let down every once in a while. But I tell my kids all the time, for all the negativity you see in the news and may experience by hearing some people talk about it, there's a whole lot of positivity and great people mm-hmm. out there. And, and let me give you a, a recent example. Um, I was just down in Florida, um, down there with my mother-in-law, my wife, and my daughter Hadley. And my friends will tell you I never carry cash, never have it. I just you know. Ditto. I just don't have cash. <laughs> Did I never do. So I had $300 in my wallet, and we went out to dinner at this brew pub right on the intercoastal waterway. Really neat place. 
Woke up the next morning, couldn't find my wallet. And I'm thinking, you need so many, there's so many reasons to need your wallet when you're out of town, mm -hmm. whether flying back with your ID and not having it. And everything. So I made a phone call to this bar or pub once it opened up, thinking for sure there was no way it was there. Or, you know, And the guy on the other end of the line exclaimed, yep, we've got your wallet, it's in the safe. And I mm -hmm. went there and all the money was in it. And I thought... Mm -hmm. Of all the, the, the places I was, um, very nice people, but it was kind of like darkly lit, you know, sorted bunch. You know, right, in right. This and when I got up, it, it fell out of my back pocket because I had shallow back pockets and these shorts. And somebody sweeping up at the end of the night just could have mm. easily have walked away and sure. humanity won. Who sure. Uh, so it was good to that's see. That's very good because my weekend with people they your suck faith was shaken a little bit yeah don't get me wrong bit. my faith gets shaken yeah too, with but i'm back but at it i'm back at it you'd agree with story. me though that more times often than not uh, for sure people come through for sure right? yeah. i agree i agree um uh the christy is uh you know christy george you know christy i don't she's got neighbors magazine is her magazine okay i think does that cover moreland hills no i don't think it does I don't know. Anyway, it's a, it's it's a monthly magazine that comes. Jim Jim Finley was on the cover not that long ago. Okay. Um, what communities does Moreland Hills cover, Molly? Do you know? You know what? Maybe Dan could share that with me. Like not communities. It it serves Moreland what, Hills, what but like where areas? where where am I if I'm in Moreland Hills? What am I looking at? So in Moreland Hills, uh, you know, we've got a pocket of diverse neighborhoods. Everything from smaller than two acre lots where i live which uh, a lot of ranches and split level homes and what streets what are our main streets so our main streets would be 91 okay um, goes right past village hall and goes right through the center mm -hmm. of town and the cabin um south woodland you know crosses over that and that would be kind of our east west <laughs> Um, River Road goes right through Moreland Hills. It's recently we dedicated that as kind of like a scenic byway for, for a number of reasons. Mm. Um, my pocket uh, of Moreland Hills where I live is the Chagrin Falls School District, but we go to two school districts in, in Moreland Hills. We have predominantly the Orange School District. And uh, then everybody that is east of River Road, which is where I am, uh, goes to Chagrin Schools. Mm -hmm. So I went to Orange, but my kids went to Chagrin, Chagrin. Schools. Um, commercial sectors, not much, uh, 91 in Chagrin Boulevard up there. You know, you've got right. crew restaurant, uh, you know, you've got, uh, ML, Flower, ML, Luna, Luna. I like going to Luna. For, Luna's awesome. For coffee. And I bakery. like sugar me, but you know, yeah, sugar me is good. Um, what is, and this is the final way I think, yeah, we're, we're going to, we're going to end it here cause we're going to keep, otherwise we'd keep going forever. <laughs> so, okay. The final lightning round question. We call this one the widow maker. Okay. <laughs> what? I, well, I, I've never said that before. I, no. called, I just made that up. <laughs> yes, you um, did. That's a funny name. What is an embarrassing thing about yourself, Dan, that very few people know and for extra credit that no one else knows? Wow. An embarrassing thing about me. Come on. There isn't some late night camping by yourself stories that you can share. No. This is what Molly wants to hear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Molly. How dare uh, see, you? There's <laughs> stories. The future Look mayor at, of Moreland Hills there's over There's stories here. right there. It's a good thing you're not running against anyone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the, one of the most embarrassing things about myself, I just think, I, my kids will tell you that I, I kind of act goofy. I, I, I do, the, I'm, I'm like guilty of the dad humor all the time and, <laughs> And uh, a lot of times I'll take it to a degree that in public places with people I haven't met that just really embarrass my kids. And they, they, I'm sure that they'd <laughs> be quick to say that one, that, that uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little out there sometimes in terms of the humor. And, and um, there was this that's one tough, though, cause time. A lot, of people, a lot of people know that about me, but there's a lot of people who don't know that about me and get surprised by it. Uh huh. So. That's my best effort at that Oof. one. Oh, there isn't a... Like, I thought you were going to go into... So then there was this time when I embarrassed them this way. There, nothing stands out. They no, were all equally embarrassing. Um, for, so uh, Yeah. Well, to give you an example, we were out west uh, this summer, and we were at Old Faithful. And so you guys been to Old Faithful? Mm -hmm. I went as a little kid, and like you could go stand on kind of like dirt and rock and wait for it to erupt. But now it's, you know, it's it's this, you know, big 
veranda with benches on it now yeah. and it's really really souped up so you, you go and you you stake your claim and you wait for old faithful to, to take off so i'm sitting there with the kids and this lady next to me um opens up her bottle of coke and it went everywhere over her and her husband like i don't know what the, if they were kicking it around like a soccer <laughs> ball but it went everywhere and I stood up and I went, there she blows. <laughs> and I thought that I thought that was the funniest thing in the world. And, it, and I thought I was going to get all kinds of laughter. And there was like a guy a couple benches away who, who snickered at it. But I think I, the people in front of me who did it, I think I pissed them off. Right. Um, and so sometimes I don't have that sense <laughs> that that's going to get them angry. And my kids could not have been more mortified. They, that is they such were a mortified. dad joke. It is yeah, a dad that joke, is such, that's a yeah, classic that's, dad joke. But we're all waiting for this thing to, you know, yeah, it totally perfect. made sense. Yeah, totally it felt, perfect. It felt normal for me. Yes, totally perfect. <laughs> that's outstanding. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, Molly. Yes. I uh, formally declare this episode of Best Podcast Ever a success. Dan, that was awesome. Thank you very much. No, yes, thank you, thank guys. You, I, Dan. Also, I think what you're both doing is just, you know, you... Molly, I always throw you accolades. You do so much oh, for the community, and I so just—you've been such an addition to the safety services and, and bringing all of that stuff. And, and, oh, thank and you. with uh, this, you know, first responder week, and Alex with the essay oh, um, contest yeah, that, I, that I've had the pleasure of being a, a judge with. I, I just enjoy so much that. reading what those kids write, and and you know, reaching out to the kids. You know, I said earlier, I like to do that with the. the the opioid stuff, mm. you know, we're kind of all, in a sense, doing that, and mm -hmm. it's that's what it takes. And so I appreciate what you sounds guys are like doing. a good subject yeah. for our. We got to put that on our for board the, for the essay contest for the next one. Yeah. Um, anything, uh, Dan, that you'd like to put out there in the universe before we uh, split? Anything you're working on? Anything at all? Go and vote. I think for I Dan Yeah, go vote House. on November fifth, and uh, you know. Take the time to, to meet the candidates who are knocking on the door. It's not easy to walk the community and knock mm -hmm. on doors of strangers. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've had some slammed in my face when I was walking for mm -hmm. council. Um, moreover, I was welcomed uh, sometimes into the home to have a lengthy discussion. And, uh, you know, it takes a lot of guts to walk around during campaign time. So, so, so give the candidates, every one of them, you know, yeah. the, the ability to come in and. Yeah. Um, well, you know, we forgot to do Molly, but which Dan just uh, reminded me of when he said candidates and walking and door to door and knocking on doors and council president, mm -mm. Paul Marnichek. Yes. <laughs> Shout out to Paul yeah. Marnichek. Yeah. Our, our super fan, Paul he Marnichek, uh, who's probably driving his car, listening to us yes. right now. We always ask our listeners what they're doing while they're listening. And huh. uh, Paul Marnichek was kind enough to comment that he listens while he commutes yeah. so uh, shout out to paul watch that dog yeah um he's soon to be council president for the city of north Royal. yes oh, good. yeah also yes. unopposed yeah good for um, him yeah. yeah i feel like if we do these podcasts enough we will soon become friends with all of the mayors that's and why city we're doing it and eventually we'll be like the unmarried power couple that's i mean that is why we d not to not to <laughs> right? Yeah, we'll it sounds we'll like always be able to like be like I know somebody. Right. I well, it was it was to to be around amazing people. It was. So Impactful. it was a selfish reason. That's true. Yeah. That's true. You are correct. Um, Molly, anything you'd like to get out to the universe? Um, the my fourth book comes out. Uh, I will be on Stephanie Schaefer's little show on Wednesday. Uh, it'll already have been uh, when you guys are listening, but we'll announce who the fourth character is for the book. Um, which we're very excited about. I think it's it's my illustrator's best work ever. Oh, good. Do you know my illustrator is a 16-year-old student not at know Chagrin that. Falls? Yeah, I've seen the books. Yeah. I didn't know that. 16-year-old, she's amazing. Um, so doing that, and then everybody is invited November 10th to the um, Chagrin Falls Fire Department calendar release party at the Township Hall from um, 2 to 4, um, I know Burntwood will have some chili there. We'll have some apple cider and we'll be, the firemen will be, firefighters will be there, um, to sign the calendars oh. and they will, we will release the pictures on the big screen. And, uh, awesome. so that is a free public event, uh, free with the understanding that we hope you purchase a, a calendar, calendar. Sure. um, uh, which will be twenty four ninety five. Uh, they will be able to be purchased at, Screen Falls Township Hall at the Visitor Center, Shed 
boutique and chagrin chagrin yoga will be selling them i think i'm going to talk to the hardware store and have them sell them for us and nice. we're working out the online you will be able to order them online and have them shipped um somewhere for out of towners because it really should be under every christmas tree this holiday season how about a chagrin hardware calendar Oof. oh yeah you gotta make jack jack would have to be like the ornery oh, october guy right my gosh yes i'm loving everything about that <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a big fan of that place oh Those my gosh people. they're the best yeah. they're the best so come out to the party it should be fun good should be fun uh what yeah about you alex well i mean i would i would encourage everyone out there particularly the business owners amongst us and you um go to uh the gertzberg law firm's page web page uh, gertzberglaw.com and subscribe to that blog because what i've been hearing more and more about from our clients is um that it has been um tremendously helpful to them um in helping avoid problems um that they don't think to ask their lawyer about they don't think to um anticipate um just nuances in the law um, how you pay employees uh, provisions in your contracts there's stuff in there, and and now, I mean, geez, we're probably years into the the that blog. There's so much on our website that's free, um, and that will help you stay out of court. You know, stay out of uh, trouble. So, and so who doesn't want to stay out of court? You I, know, I mean, it's not fun. No. It's not. I tell people all the time, even when we knock it out of the park. Our clients are still like, just like, oh, I wish that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so go click, uh, go subscribe to our blog or like us on on Facebook and you'll get all those blogs. Um, and uh, and hopefully that's there's stuff on there that you'll find helpful, um, particularly to business owners. Uh, this was awesome, Dan. Thank you very much. Dan, um, be safe out there. I'll do that. Yeah. Please. Thank there's you very one much more for this thing. opportunity. There's one more thing I forgot. Uh, whatever you're listening to us on, folks... Right. Whatever you're you're if you're if you've listened this far, if you are now well over an hour into this podcast, then you are uh, you're Dan's married. Right? Mother, you're Dan's mom and you're Dan's, wife. Dan's wife, Dan's kids. Probably. Hadley, is it? Hadley. Did you know Jared that? and Jake? Yeah. Hadley, not sister. So she's she's already done. She, you, should she tell, uh, this far. you should tell Hadley that um, one of the most famous um, um, lawsuits that they teach in every law school towards class is a case called Hadley versus Baxendale. Oh, really? And that is know. the case that established that if you commit a tort against somebody, a civil wrong, you may be liable not just for the direct harm that you caused them, but for a lot of the consequential harm. That the ripple. Is the ripple wow. effect. Okay. The Hadley ripple. versus Baxendale. Remember it for the rest of my life. And uh, yeah. before we close, <laughs> I, I would be remiss without giving shout outs to Dan's sister and niece, yeah. who are my besties, and I love them to death. Yeah, they're all fun to hang out oh with. Oh, my gosh. We have, we have a lot of fun. I love this, them. This is what John gets mad at us about. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad, John. For declaring, uh, declaring the uh, podcast a Hi success. Hi, Ashley. And just talking. Hi, Gracie. Um, uh, if, Hi, you are, if you are um, more than just um, Dan's family listening to this podcast, um, the, but, but especially if you are them, <laughs> whatever you're listening to, on, uh, to us on should give you the ability to, um, to leave us a little rating or comment or note or feedback, or so, especially if it's iTunes, then it's the easiest thing. But do that do that molly molly could be doing anything with her time right now but no she's here except reading a book except not that. reading a book for sure every or monday <laughs> almost every monday molly is here grudgingly powering through these podcasts you know why folks you know why folks because she wants because she wants your likes because i yes, likes. who she's, doesn't want to like so help molly out folks help help Molly, out. who doesn't want leave a us thumbs a, up? Leave us a, a a comment or a like and make Molly or feel good. Or a dislike. Good. I'm, I'm no no, I'm, no dislikes. I'm okay for that. Thanks for tuning in, folks. We'll see you next time. See ya. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we thank you for listening. And remember to check out the Gertzberg Law Firm if you're starting, running, growing, or transitioning a business, or if you need to create or update your wills, trusts, or estate plan. Our firm and our lawyers are among the highest caliber and well-recognized professionals in the field. We are veteran-owned, 
have the highest rankings from super lawyers and the other key attorney rating organizations. And we were recently added to the coveted Weatherhead 100. More than being respected by our peers, our clients rely on us to successfully defend them in court, help them avoid the courtroom with our Cover My Six service, protect their assets, and for many non-legal business services like recruiting and business development. More than just litigators, we are trusted advisors, problem solvers, and growers of businesses. Let us help you and your company. Call us or find us online to learn more. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you next time.